Greetings. It is that time again. The mic still works, yes? Hello, hello, hello. Hello, your mic works as well. Excellent. Perfect. Um, I see we've got Daniel on the line as well from Flux. Perfect. Okay. This is your opportunity for a mic check if you'd like. Can you hear me? Yes, that sounds great. Awesome. All right. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Now carry about carry about your day. We'll give everybody a few more minutes to be able to come on in and then, you know, <laughs> rock and roll. It's just a kindness to be able to do the mic check at like the top of the meeting before everyone gets in here. For sure. <laughs> the part where everyone's like, "The man, what's Zo what mic Zoom pick today?" Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got 25 folks in the line and two minutes past. Um, and I know we're probably going to need most of the time today. So, Dims, your show, ending to you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Today is April 19th, and this is the meeting for the CNCF TOC. Uh, you're all here, so <laughs> you don't need that. Uh, members here today um, will take a uh, note of the people who are here and who are not. Today we'll be mainly talking about Flux and uh, their application for graduation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, uh, can we quickly identify who's here from the Flux side? I know Daniel is here, so Daniel. Yes, I'm here and uh, other Flux maintainers are Philip, Max, Michael, some Tochi, Scott, that's all I can see right now. I'm sure there's maybe one yeah. or more. Uh, sounds oh, good. No. Okay. Yeah. From the TOC side, um, I wanted to make sure we have um, Matt, Cornelia, Harry, any of them around? Uh, Cornelia actually gave regrets. Matt is also regrets, and uh, we'll give Harry a few more minutes to be able to come on in. So, so yeah, yeah. I'll keep an eye on. Thank you. Uh, just let me know when he's he joins. So, um, Daniel, I I guess you'll be taking the lead today uh, from the flux side. Uh, why don't you kick us off, please? Yeah, maybe um, uh, myself and Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so here is the, the full text of our graduation application. Um, so we've been in incubation since I think no, um, more than a year now. And we've been working through basically all the check boxes we, we needed to tick. We've had a governance process for I think one and a half years now. It's been working well for us. Um, we have quite a few people from WeaveWorks who, who maintain Flux, but we also have people from, from other organizations. Um, we completed the security audit and we fixed all the issues they found. And, and uh, security also has like a big, has been a big focus lately. We've also been writing quite a bit about it. And adoption has also gone up quite a bit. We've seen 
bigger and bigger um, deployments everywhere. Um, Michael, do you want to say a few words? Maybe what what happened on the on the technical side, or anything you would like to to highlight? Yeah. Uh, so there's really one major change on the technical side, which is that um, Flux was version one when it went into Sandbox, or around that time, um, and then uh, I think since incubation. Uh, we've been developing a version two, which um, is the same idea, but modernizes uh, all the APIs and so on so that they work with uh, things like custom resource definitions and Kubernetes, which didn't exist when we created Flux version one. So that's quite a big change that um, resulted in sort of a, a leap uh, in interest, from, especially from um, vendors who are building things on top of Flux. Um, so we've seen there's kind of two aspects to Flux. There is the bit you can build on top of, and then there is the end user bit, which are, I mean, they're actually mostly the same bits, but it's two different types of user. Um, and both of those have, I think, seen a sort of leap in, um, in adoption since we started Flux 2. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, to start off, are, are there any TOC members that would like to ask some questions or I, I can get started too. I see Richie, you are here and you have the video on. Would you like to ask something? No, I read through everything. I'm pretty happy. Okay. Uh, thank you. We do have uh, Harry on the line. Harry, hi. Hi, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, I, I can get started, Harry, while you settle down and then you can, uh, you know, start asking the questions, okay? Yep. Okay, so um, so I wanted to ask you about the governance process that you've mentioned. Um, how has it been working and has there been, um, you know, diversification of uh, the companies, uh, you know, what stage you are in at this point? So basically we defined um, roles in the project. So we have maintainers, contributors, all of this needed to be spelled out. And basically all the processes are on GitHub. So we have voting and um, let me uh, check. So we have, uh, people from um, CrowdStrike, D2IQ, uh, Microsoft, NextHealth, Tetra, Zenit. So it's a, it's a couple of other um, companies who are involved, who are involved in the project as maintainers as, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, then the other question I had was around the bootstrapping of the project governance, the oversight committee is still there. Um, will it be around for longer or is it going to go away? Is there a timeline to it? Um, my, I don't think we've, we've, we've used it at all lately. It was mostly just, uh, Michael, maybe you can remind me what it's there for or what it was there for. I think it's for, I don't know. Or time yeah, so, yeah, kind of. Um, the governance in Flux is very deliberately um, consensus oriented. Um, so, Actually, it is less about having a sort of, you know, ultimate authority to tie break as it is about just making sure that people are following the rules. That's why mm -hmm. it's sort of oversight rather than, you know, um, the council of, uh, council of elders. Um, the, it's in a way, it's sort of a transitional thing and it can, it can really go away once we have figured out what should replace it, which might be something like, um, you know, a steering committee, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's just been, that was exactly been a lot to do. We, yeah, uh, we used that exact same model in Kubernetes. There was a bootstrap committee. There was an expiry date on it, and before the expiry date, uh, we elected a fresh set of people, and they are the ones, uh, you know, serving from that point onwards. Um, so, is, yeah, 
has there been talk about um, what follows it? Because it seems like we need to get the you know solidify the governance a little bit more. Uh, that's what it feels like at this point. It would be good to have a consensus on the on the plan, and at that point we we should yeah, establish an expiry date for the uh, for the oversight committee. Um, there has been a bit of talk, but most of it's private um, opportunities to for everyone to talk are uh, uh, not that many, um, mm -hmm. you know, except asynchronously on Slack and so on. Um, uh, possibly the Kubicon, either the one coming up or one after might be a good opportunity. I know there is a kind of breakout room being planned. Daniel, is that right? Sorry, I was just looking up some of the old discussion about it. So can you just say the last sentence again? I, I was wondering whether the, the next Kubicon would be a good opportunity for more people to kind of discuss yeah. what comes next. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think yeah, we have so, time set aside for everyone to talk. So. Yeah, that sounds like a really good uh, idea and a plan. Um, and I let other people ask questions and then we can come back to it a little bit. Um, Katie, did you have any questions? Not yet. Actually, I missed the first half of the meeting, unfortunately, because of some of my uh, Zoom issues, but I will um, I'll get back by the end. Yeah. So uh, Don on uh, chat says, uh, please uh, come by the governance working group. They meet on a Thursday, one Thursday a month. Uh, so please join them uh, and ask, you know, what are the various combinations that are possible and, uh, you know, how to go around, go about setting up something that will work for you. Okay. So um, the other question I had about reading through the materials was, um, at one point there was uh, some discussion about the collaboration, cooperation with Argo CD folks. Um, I know they were... Uh, there, there was some set of meetings and then uh, uh, there was an agreement to go separate ways. Has there been any follow-ups on, um, you know, some overlap or some sharing of uh, technical stuff um, or components, uh, you know, in the recent past? The short answer, and which is also the long answer, is um, no, <laughs> there hasn't been. Um, we are kind of still in touch individually with people um, work on Argo CD and there's a bit of um, co-opetition there, I think. Um, but no, we, there's no kind of official or formal follow-ups. Um, if you don't Scott, mind, you uh, want to type something? Yeah, real, real quick. I'll, I'll try, I'll just use up my, my voice energy for this one. Um, okay. Uh, there was, during last KubeCon, um, myself and one of the other Flux maintainers, um, or, or one of the other people from the Flux team, um, chatted with the Argo developers. Um, our booths weren't that far apart. And, um, and the idea was, hey, now that, now that Flux 2 has been made to be componentized, uh, really, ultimately, what my understanding is I wasn't around at that time when the initial plan was made, but, but the idea of, of how Flux is going to be refactored to, to play well with other projects as, for example, Argo, has already happened in Flux too, just in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. As Michael said, we have, a, we have a note about what the status is of that inside the Flux docs, for those who rem remember that earlier plan. Um, they, were only, they were interested it's, uh, I also spoke with Dan from Codefish just because they put, they put a lot of energy behind Argo as well, um, but, and the Acuity folks. Um, and so they were very interested in that, especially because there are a lot of bugs in, in Argo and um, a lot of feature requests that are already finished in Flux. Uh, and the Argo UI is something that people like the most. So the thought was, why don't we just combine the two? And the only other update is that um, Chan went one of the other Flux maintainers has created a, a project called the Flux subsystem for Argo that 
that does just that. So it doesn't have wide adoption yet, but that's something to look out for. And a lot, a lot of folks are excited about that. Uh, th thank you for that answer. And I hope uh, we didn't hurt your throat too much uh, there. Um, no. Harry, okay. yeah. uh, Harry uh, do you have a, a set of questions to ask the team? Yeah, I think my main question is around um, what is the current adoption of the Flux project? I may, maybe you have mentioned this um, in the meeting, so I missed that part. Um, but uh, what I'm curious on is what about the end user adoption? It's the best um, Basically, Basically, uh, for example, um, besides the cloud provider, besides the cloud providers or vendors, so what, what, how how is the adoption in end user side? Daniel, do you want me to jump in? Uh, hi, I'm Tomo. Um, I'm in the, uh, I run the developer experience team here at uh, WeaveWorks, and we work closely with our community. So some of our most exciting um, recent adopters that Daniel has just shared in the link include um, SAP, Ring Central, Volvo, um, and then we've had other companies like SoulCycle in there, like some of the more recognizable, let's say, like consumer names, um, as well as more and more people who add themselves not only on the Flux side, but on the Flagger side, which is you know now a sub project of Flux. And so it's been exciting to work with more and more companies who um, have added themselves. And then you know, unfortunately, we work with very large financial corporations who are not allowed to add themselves. Um, but it's pretty exciting of what they're doing with both Flux and Flagger um, and developing those areas and, uh, you know, really pushing the boundaries of, of how we're developing Flux for them. So that's a short answer. Yeah, maybe one big to mention is the Department of Defense who've been working with other US agencies on platform one, and they are rolling out um, services for 100,000 developers, which is, which is just uh, fantastic. It's, it's huge. Yeah, and I'll add to that, we've been, um, you know, we've designed Flux to obviously protect people's privacy and, and, you know, people can just download and it's, it's my job to have that very difficult monthly task of trying to capture metrics. Um, and trying to sort of connect that to how many human beings are using. So we've been starting to interview our community members to get a better sense of that. And already some of the first people we've talked to would say like, well, we've got our platform team of let's say like 80 to 100 people who live and breathe Flux, set it up for their users. And then there could be like upwards of you know 2000 developers in a company who may not even know what the word Flux means but they're going and making a change to YAML and they're benefiting from, you know, GitOps. Um, and so that's where we're starting to try to gather this information to the best of our abilities to understand, you know, how many human beings are actually using Flux. Um, but that's a, that's a journey that's uh, very manual, but we're doing that because it's worth getting that information. Uh, Katie? Yes, so considering uh, that I joined late, this question might have been answered. So I'm just going to ask uh, just to make sure that I got that, got that covered for myself. Uh, the first question is, uh, looking at the maintainers list and the contributor list, um, there are maintainers, but they're quite singular per organization, which means if they no longer are in the organization or they no longer want to participate, they, that entire work just cannot be listed as a maintainer. So my question is, are there any plans to expand the maintainers and contributors in these orgs and not have just singular contributors. Um, this is one, and then I'm going to put my other question. Uh, I can take a crack at that, um, but let me uh, replay the question. So um, I think it was the, the, the sort of one one company represented quite strongly in the maintainers and therefore succession uh, may be a problem. Is, yeah, you're nodding, great. Precisely, so like uh, I'm looking through for your proposal here for graduation. So for example, from D2IQ, you have like one maintainer from Microsoft, it's one maintainer. So if they decide not to be there any longer, like it's pretty much one organization less, which you, know, you can consider it as a committer, like a strong committer. Yeah, so uh, a kind of two a two part response to that. One is that um, there are projects which which are driven by a single company, 
um, and and that is balanced by perhaps governance by having a sort of user committee where which where the company is not represented, um, and so the governance kind of has checks and balances to make sure that um, you know even though, though the maintainers are from a single company or you know have a very strong representation from a single company, actually it's driven by the the community. So that's part number one. And the second part is that. Um, Yes, we would love to have more sort of organizational contributors or and, and or maintainers so that succession um, is sort of less of a risk, if you like. Um, if we had a magic wand, that's probably the first wish. Um, but it's quite difficult being a sort of um, maybe mid-sized project to get organizations on board because it's quite an investment for people. You know, that probably means that organization has to dedicate a certain number of developers and there's just not that many places you know willing to make that investment um so what we get is is more like um places that don't necessarily want to make a strategic uh strategic investment but do recognize that their interests lie in the direction of helping with flux so therefore a particular individual uh gets to spend some of their time being a maintainer um so that's our kind of route to having a more diverse set of maintainers is, is more likely to be in that direction um, you know, until uh, Flux is quite a lot bigger, I would think. Uh, so the other one, um, a twist to this, Michael, is, is there another role which is not uh, like in a maintainer, but you know, a reviewer? If you have a role like that, then you could possibly have like somebody who is just getting into the community who is looking at stuff and make them a reviewer first. So at least you have like a person with a role and then you can have like a contributor ladder at that point and say, oh, hey, you start off as a general community member, uh, we'll add you to the GitHub org and then you become a reviewer and then you become an approver maintainer. Like, so have, if you have some kind of ladder system there, uh, at least you will you will set up a pipeline of folks um, that you could pull on um, next, right? Yeah, we do in fact have a contributor ladder um, and there is a contributor named contributor role that um, there's a very sort of lightweight process to become a contributor and you get to be part of the organization and mm -hmm. you get some sort of triage. I think what you mean by reviewer um, right. kind of fairly light responsibilities but you know you're part of the project um so we do have that um that doesn't mean that people are sort of you know i think that helps a bit because it sort of um makes that slope a bit more gradual right um but it doesn't solve the essential problem which is that it's still investment of someone's time or organization's resources to uh to even get on that ladder right that someone has to ask their boss can I spend time on this effectively yeah um so I think it probably has helped a bit um there's I'm sure there's lots of other stuff we could do to help that more um and there's also quite a step from being a contributor to a maintainer nonetheless with with sort of not much in between yeah Katie did you have another question yes um another question I had was um you're mentioning here that you have a solid roadmap and you're mentioning that you want to um, maybe work more on security and multi-tenancy. Would it be possible to share like a roadmap or more details rather than just kind of a few pointers um, for us to see like what's next for this project and uh, what's gonna be considered to be done? Well, pretty much in the next year or so. So that's like a follow-up. Uh... You know, you, you can speak to it too, if you, Michael or Daniel, if you want to. But you know, we're looking for some more information when you update the PR next. I think Daniel probably knows a bit more about this than I do because he uh, helps maintain some of those pages. But um, the roadmap as it stands is um, the milestones are, are um, not so much features as they are sort of stages of maturity. So, um, you know, the, the sort of big thing that was passed was was being um, having parity with 
Flux V1 in, in Flux V2. That was a while ago. The next big one is having a GA release of Flux V2. Um, so it, it's more about sort of um, uh, project maturity. Um, we have had a push on security stuff. I'm not sure whether that's represented in roadmaps that are, are published as opposed to more sort of internal project board type stuff. Um, which are not actually internal, they're also public, just um, uh, not as pointed to as the, the roadmaps on the website. Daniel, is there other roadmap material? Yes, I just shared some of the projects, project boards we're using. Um, so there's the, uh, sorry, the roadmap document we shared in the um, application. And the other ones are just more detail so one view is which i shared is basically for the next releases and the other one is just the the ga focus that we that we have understood awesome. um so yeah go ahead Katie. i have another question if, if that's okay um yeah. so this is more like forward looking as well uh, based on the on the roadmap and the next work you want to do for flux but so far um well we, we know that flux is composed of multiple components um, and we've had this kind of projects um, uh, previously as well. Um, for example, the Operator 8 SDK had like three standalone projects and they actually it would, made more sense for them to go their separate ways towards the incubation and graduation. Um, do you envisage any of these components to take it off by itself? Um, or do you see all of this still part of the Flux project and very kind of I wouldn't like to use the monolith, um, but like, you know, like in that perspective, do you perceive all of these components to be part of the same monolith to make everything work? Or do you envisage some of this to maybe uh, take off by itself? There's kind of two bits, uh, aspects to that. There's the sort of political aspect or social aspect, isn't there? And, and then there's the um, technical aspect. So technically they're all quite strongly coupled and the, um, so they mostly sort of make sense um, all together, the bits, um, and um, and people can third parties can can kind of use components individually, um, and they do. Um, but in terms of sort of an end user, you know, boxed product, it is all the bits at once, really. Um, socially, it tends to be mostly all the same people, so there there isn't really there's not really different separate um, constituencies, if you like. Um, the, if there is an exception to both of those things, it's Flagger, but that actually moved in the other direction. It was a separate project, and then it came into Flux as a sub-project, and so it seems less likely that it'll sort of break away again. Um, it's not quite as coupled, technically speaking, with the other bits, um, and it is sort of has its own aspects of community and so on that are not necessarily shared with the, the rest of flux but broadly it's more like the, the motion tends to be coming together rather than splitting apart um, for the foreseeable future i think um so let me ask you a follow-up on the flagger itself uh, what was the kind of um the thinking or process that you had in place um through the governance uh, work to make the decision of inviting flagger as a sub project um, of flux and how did it look like like you know how did it start what were the decision points and like who ended up making the decisions and how, how it got to be invited i don't remember exactly <laughs> but i, I can take a I could take a high level stab. Uh, unfortunately, Stefan, who created Flagger, um, had to get pulled away this week um, and, and can't be here to answer that question, but, um, but very high level. Um, we have many users of um, Flagger who um, use it with Flux or use it with many other tools, which is equally very, very exciting. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, um, so originally Stefan did design Flagger with Flux in mind. So um, we have both a commitment to ensure that it continues to support other tools, while we also felt that it made sense to make it part of the Flux project because we wanted to ensure that there was also a path that was optimized 
for people who use Flagger and Flux together because that's how it was originally designed. Um, so that was the just very basic um, high level logic of thinking that it made, it made sense to have them be a single project as opposed to, you know, having Flagger be its, its standalone thing. So that's yeah, a very basic I, I totally get that part. It's just the, um, you know, if you're talking about an open community and open design and open discussions and things like that, uh, there has to be, you know, things written down, things done async, uh, voting perhaps, uh, right? Uh, for the governance to actually work, right? In a repeatable fashion, where if there is another component that is coming in, then would you do exactly the same set of steps or would you like, you know, change what you're doing? Right, that's part of the governance. I know that you you recently started um, uh, writing down design documents for things, uh, you know, but I don't think that was there when the flagger stuff came in. Um, so that's why I'm poking at it. Uh, you know, where the decisions taken behind the scenes, or there was ample, um, you know. Uh, discussion in public forums where people could chime in on things. Um, yeah, we dis we discussed this in the in the flux meeting for for a longer time, and at the time it was Stefan and Takeshi um, at Tetrate, who's also a flagger maintainer. They talked about this behind the scenes as as well, and the idea was also to rebase. Um, flagger on top of the flux controllers. So for example, to use the notification controller for doing all the notification things, that work is slowly ongoing in the process. It's a bigger chunk of work, but it it just felt like it it made sense. And we had like a long um, this, or request for comment period and everyone was on board. I think all the flux maintainers sent, sent off on this. So that was at least at least three or four months in the in the making. Yeah. So Scott says exactly it was discussed multiple times in the community meeting. So that's good. So basically, I'm asking that because uh, typically what happens is like when you end up, you know, taking decisions like that, you end up codifying. So next time it's easier to to do the same set of things, right? Like yeah. that. That's how we grow the governance uh, and like make sure that. You know the best practices are captured, so next time you it's easier uh, getting through the process. Uh, so to absolutely, say. like one big question was also for whenever there was some experimentation going on somewhere, the question was, do we really want this in Flux CD? Are we really going to maintain this? So that's why we also created the Flux CD community organization, where we have some projects that people started working on that still need to be tried and tested before they can before we say, okay, we're going to support this. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Harry, did you have any other questions uh, or Katie? I have another question. Or, or, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, kind of changing the subjects as well. Um, so another thing, uh, which again, just for visibility um, and, uh, you know, kind of seeing the, the progress, uh, there have been a bunch of to-do items from the incubation uh, that you've mentioned that has been addressed. Do you have a list of them that we can actually easily check? Um, that's going to be very helpful. Or if you know anything on top of on top of your head that you can kind of list now, that's going to be helpful too. Give me a moment and I'll find it. Um, I know one we haven't done yet. The ask was to move the Flagger website under under the Flux website to move the documentation there, and that's not quite done yet. So that's one I know of, but I'll, I'll find the list for you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Katie, for that question. Uh, I know Jay, Dave just joined. Dave, um, if you wanted to ask some questions uh, right away, uh, please do, or you know, we'll continue the conversations that we've been having. Yeah, I guess uh, keep going. I'm just jumping from yeah. other meetings. So I have to like pull up my notes and everything. <laughs> if there's stuff I if there's stuff I ask, I'll jump in a bit later. Right now, I'm super unprepared. <laughs> No worries. Uh, Harry, uh, did you have any other questions or anybody else uh, on the call? Um, I spot Liz too, uh, who, who was there when we did the incubation portion. I wrote, I wrote down a quick question. It was more to like for, for, um, for writing down. Is there any 
like relevant dependency on a project that would be at a lower sustainability level than what is expected for graduation in CNCF, something you would depend on that uh, would need to be there for Flux uh, to, to operate properly? Yeah, uh, uh, Ricardo, like HCD and Kubernetes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. In this in this <laughs> line. In this line. No, yeah. just something that could be like incubation or sandbox or something outside the CNCF. Yeah. Uh, Flex team, all yours. I don't quite understand the question. So can you paraphrase it uh, or um are are there any dependencies? outside of the Flux um, uh, repositories that Flux he heavily depends upon, but it is underfunded. Right, I see. Uh, so kind of risks of those being abandoned or, but yeah. Um, the, so there's three I can think of off the top of my head, not that don't necessarily have those risks, but you might be able to judge for yourself. So there's two Git libraries that um, Flux depends on. One's uh, pure Go implementation and one's uh, bindings to libgit2. Um, those, I think, seem pretty stable um, and just sort of chug along, um, but uh, you, know, you, you sort of never know what's going on behind the scenes. The other one I can think of is SOPs, um, which is, um, we're not totally sure what the story is there, but Mozilla um, sort of has changed what it funds recently. Um, and that's a Mozilla funded project. Um, I think there are plans or at least wishes afoot um, to try and find another home for it or to um, somehow keep it going. Um, those are the three that I can think, things that I can think of that kind of fit that description. Um, other dependencies are things like Helm, um, yeah. which I think is, does not fit <laughs> that description. Um, there's not that many, there's not that many kind of large, difficult to reproduce dependencies. Those are the ones I can think of. Yeah, uh, Scott, please go ahead. Uh, yes, um, just the one update on SOPS is that there's been some meetings with the Mozilla team um, very recently. Um, and I'm not sure, Michael, if you saw this because it was very, very recent. So, but um, <clears throat> but the, the, uh, the understanding now is that Mozilla Corp will keep supporting SOPS. Um, basically SOPS is not dead. <laughs> uh, Mozilla Corp, Corp will keep supporting SOPS for one year and welcomes new maintainers. Um, AJ will be the lead maintainer. I'm just reading from my notes now, but I'm trying to update you. <clears throat> will be the lead maintainer and hopes to keep making releases, but the releases will be at a maintain and improve pace for now. So, you know, at the moment, there will not be big feature development until the maintainers grow in number and time commitment. Um, yeah, and there was some discussion about, uh, um, uh, you know, whether or not they may want to donate stops to CNCF um, or like just open that discussion. Um, but they, they are not considering that at this moment. Oh, got it. I guess the reason for asking this question is like, even, uh, you know, the end users of CNCF, we ha they have to have a sense that, you know, Flux will be around and the things that Flux depends on are going to be around so they can depend uh, on on that uh, matt you ha ha raised your hands a couple of times please go go ahead oh yeah sorry i went from a phone to a monitor so i just raised my hand once um so uh I i'm super thrilled to see all this uh given that many organizations um are basing their compliance strategies around adopting GitOps with a combination of automation uh, so robots do all the things <laughs> um, and the normative cases are, are have compliance generate documentation generated. Um, is there any, could you speak to the roadmap around how tooling 
uh, either observability tooling, compliance tooling, auditing tooling, uh, can in a consistent open way uh, get sort of the record, uh, if you will, of all of the deployments and their specifics so that there can be an open standard, sort of like open telemetry is for, you know, metrics, logs, and traces that, that can foster an ecosystem of vendors that can provide differentiated solutions to different market segments. Um, you know, given the adoption of Flux and the momentum, uh, you know, what are the plans to either surface that or are there any plans to propose or work uh, in, on an open standard for, for what just the data format is sort of like open metrics is to, you know, metrics, um, where it's just a, a wire format so that people can integrate, but it doesn't uh, get into implementation or workflows or things like that. It's just data. So is there any sort of standard like that planned or what are the project's thoughts about that as it, as it eyes graduation and really, um, you know, increasing this momentum around GitOps in general, as realized by Flux as the actor. I think that that's a really interesting question, and um, and I think, well, to my knowledge, there's there's not at least not out in the public discussion um, about exactly that thing. Flux does have um, a few kind of observability surfaces, if you like. Um, one of them is that it uses uh, custom resources. So you can go look at those to see the status of things. It exports Prometheus metrics, which is not a generic standard, but it is uh, fairly widely adopted. Um, and it um, sends uh, notifications to things like you know, Slack, Pager Duty, or whatever. Um, none of those things, uh, you know, the schemas and, and um, formats, metrics are not standardized. Um, I think I would expect that to go something like perhaps the um, open GitOps group would come up with schemas and metrics and so on, and then Flux would implement, you know, adopt those or adapt. Um, Scott, can you uh, speak to that or type to that? Uh, yes, I, I was just, to keep it short, I was just going to say that, uh, <clears throat> that um, I pasted the timeline again. Uh, uh, Katie, um, for your question, because I just, sorry, I took a moment. I, I just saw your question in the chat. Um, and also what you had asked earlier, Liz. So I think the, the most important thing is, I, I've tried to cover the most important thing in this, in this migration timetable. But if there's any other details, like Michael, if, were there any details you wanted me to cover that I around this or do you think it's sufficient to just send this timetable basically in short i'm responsible for um making sure that the community is aware of this that people have an adequate time period um and um uh the i and also the entire flux team is uh is very cognizant of making sure that all of the steps needed to upgrade are, are as seamless as possible. That's our major goal. Um, additionally, um, Kingdon Barrett has been primarily tasked with focusing on um, supporting Flux V1 users. And from his, from what, I don't know if Kingdon's on the call. I don't think so. Yeah, but in any case- uh, Kingdon speaking. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> but in any case, Kingdon has um, said that the, has been giving updates too on on the on the flux v1 support requests and a, a very large number of those mostly are about how to upgrade to v2 and what problems um, are solved by by upgrading got it uh emily do, do you want to uh, yeah. Um, so I didn't really have a ton of questions. So first off, I want to give kudos to the group for um, making it very transparent. They're tracking and completion of the recommendations from the audit. It looks like you all have come pretty close to closing nearly everything out. And for those items that aren't closed, you have a lot of things in flight with some, looks like some active discussion or pointers. However, one of the recommendations within the audit report was to reach out to the security tag. And I was curious around some, of, some more of the context and why that recommendation was made as well as when do you plan on engaging with the security tag um, and did you have any goals or scope in mind for that engagement?
Uh, the recommendation was made by the auditors, um, Ada Logics, um, and that was actually something. I mean, we spent quite a lot of time discussing their recommendation um, after they kind of made them um, to better understand them. And um, I think the the specific recommendation recommendation uses the security tag as an example of someone we might engage with. Um, and with the other um, examples being uh, independent security researchers and um, consultants. And we um, would like to engage with security tag. I think it's something that we'd have to kind of have an ongoing, uh, like build an ongoing relationship with. Um, we haven't been sure exactly how to engage with security tag. They are a really busy group. Um, yeah, we we have a maintainer, Paolo, who I think sort of has, um, you know, an in there and may be able to help us out with that. Um, but yeah, that's something we would still like to do. Um, it, See, we weren't sure on what terms we would we do that because um, it's, it wasn't quite how other projects engage with them. We don't quite have the same. We didn't have an established relationship to go in with. We'd still like to do that. Um, I think the suggestion yeah. was, so the, the audit was sort of comprised of, of three parts. The first one was, um, around fuzzing, then there was a code review. And uh, when we talked to Ada Logics in the, in, the very, uh, in the very beginning, they said, is there anything else you would like us to, to review or, or cover for you? And there was one proposal we, we started putting together around, um, around multi-tenancy. And they reviewed this and it wasn't quite a real proposal. It was, it was more in a, in a draft, idea and and i think that's where the ask came from said like you need a proper uh, rfc pro process and talk to the security tag and since then we've we've implemented the rfc process um but we yeah as michael said we haven't reached out to the security tag about about this yet that's at least my yeah, sorry, that's that's what i was sort of stumbling over it towards the end there was that the recommendation was kind of attached to a, a particular design, um, how to improve it. And when we looked at it, that didn't, that wasn't really how people engaged with the security tag. It was not about necessarily specific designs improving those. Um, so we sort of went a different route on that. Um, so I would recommend then that engaging with the security tag, specifically their security pals program to assist in that multi-tenancy review would be beneficial. Okay. They do have a path for that. Um, you can file an issue with the group or you can drop a line in the Slack channel and see, um, see what they're recommending right now. But the security pal is more of a direct engagement specifically for a, a scoped effort. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Um, so I do have a follow-up on what Emily was asking, which is, uh, so is the, is the security process well defined in terms of, um, you know, here is the incoming queue, here is how you uh, put something in which is private that the team will look at, and who is responsible for doing the initial triage, and then um, engaging with the people to uh, that are opening uh, that are uh, talking about a security vulnerability and then getting other people to work on uh, the bug itself or a, a patch or a workaround and then uh, the CVE process at the end. Is this all documented? Do you have a set of people that are thinking about just this uh, security process, how to work it? Can we call upon Paulo? Because I see Paulo's here. Are you willing to? Paulo is here. We can't hear you, Paulo. We can't hear you. Paulo has been dedicated to this and is very organized and communicative. So I've been really, really thankful to have Paulo helping with this. We can't hear you. 
Hey, Dems, I can jump in real quick. Uh, looking over their documentation, their security process is actually fairly well defined and, and relatively robust. They have um, their existing process on vulnerability reporting and management. They don't have a ton of details on the assignment of bug fixes and vulnerability fixes, which is normal for um, most projects. As long as they have a defined process and a way to report it, they're good. Um, they've identified the individuals as well as their fingerprints associated with it. So you know that you're talking to a security person within the project and they have additional security specific documentation that is still being worked, but it, it's fairly robust. Uh, if you're happy, I'm happy <laughs> for sure. Uh, let's see if Paulo got back in if you wanted to add something. No, I don't see him here yet. Um, okay, opening the floor again. Any other questions from anyone? Going once, going twice, going thrice. Okay. Um, so, was this helpful? Uh, did did this uh, the lines of questioning that you heard today? Is it helpful for you to make up your mind uh, and like add more things to either uh, you know? the the PR proposal itself or you know how you would do other things uh, between now and when you graduate. The so question for that, is that a question for us? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, some very good specific advice. Um, and also um, I think there's uh, some reasonably clear sort of areas of concern, uh, you know, for instance, um, dependency risk, um, which kind of point to maybe at least being able to write about those things and say, you know, here is the plan. I think we have some. Um, there's always more stuff you can do, of course, but um, yeah, certainly lots of things to think about and maybe some stuff we can incorporate in the uh proposal as well Scott. and and michael i just i had just um sent some text that i don't want to read out loud uh, and, uh, to that to that question uh, after a short chat with hida one of the other maintainers um over text so i hope that's helpful to those asking about dependencies for example you know uh controller runtime is you know Kubernetes controller runtime? GA, it's not, but um, Kubernetes it depends on it, and so it exactly is. right. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Okay, so sounds good. Um, if we are there any other questions from the floor? Going once, going twice. I think we can call it a wrap unless. Uh... Okay, so. Thanks a lot for everybody for your time uh, and hope uh, we continue the conversation. I know you're looking for a sponsor for, for this and that that's the, you know, <laughs> the biggest uh, ask from you all, I think. Um, so uh, Amy, did you have any, any thoughts here? What we've done before in the past is like a, a sponsor kind of like shows up in the meeting. Um, here, I'm not really seeing that. Um, and, and I feel like there's a lot of like open questions around in here. Um, normally, we would say, come back and reapply in six months, which for you all would be September. Um, does that give you a long enough time to be able to like work through some of these issues? Does that make sense? Or do you want to try to be able to look like something over the summer? If I can jump in, um, I mean, I'd be interested to see if people have the same impression of it being pretty open ended because we feel, especially with the security audit and all the steps we went through and our, you know, we feel fairly robust application. Um, I guess I'd want to understand. I mean, we, we would prefer not to delay another six months. Um, you know, we've put all these pieces together and um, we have people we've had people sort of share their thoughts on um, sponsorship. So I don't feel like there's going to be a delay on confirming the actual person. We've got quite a few candidates. So, um, you know, unless there's some kind of strong opinion, we definitely would not want to put this out another six months. 
yeah i would say one one thing that doesn't necessarily come through very strongly when people are asking questions is is you know what what the stakes are so the sort of you know it, question about dependencies for instance um are the stakes that you know if that's a problem then no we have to we have to go back and rethink or is that just we need this information we just need to know that something is in place you've thought about it um so i don't know how we can come by that information about you know what the actual stakes are with some of these questions um is it going to stop is it going to be a, like a veto kind of um yeah uh, so situation all, or, or not these are all questions that we would end up asking when you start doing the due diligence doc um so you know where uh, you would end up identifying okay these are the things that are risks but we are not currently uh, working on a, on some of these specific things but other things we feel are the team feels that it is uh, something that they need to deal with quickly so we are going to like pull in a few people to to work on something so uh, at this point i think uh, we we probably have three people uh, three liaisons to uh, sig app delivery um, it, it, uh, matt and uh, cornelia and uh, harry i think i would give them first whack at uh, being a sponsor um uh, harry did you have any thoughts here today or do you want to take some time to think about all the discussion here i think i will try to uh, sync the whole information with all the other um chairs uh, to reach some conclusion okay so you need some time to think about it got it uh, scott you had you have your hands raised raised uh yes um <clears throat> Just on this, on this one topic, uh, uh, I think it, one thing that was fairly unclear was the triage process. Um, I know that folks are busy as well. That's that's another thing. Um, but it was not clear to me. Um, I, I think when when uh, I had I had just informally asked Matt Farina, for example, because he had just joined the DOC, and um, uh, I guess was not able to make it today, but. But um, uh, what he had transmitted back was that, um, you know, hey, we should probably stop asking <laughs> you folks, you know, and, and uh, totally, uh, you know, no, whatever is best, of course. Um, but that he had mentioned that there, that, that there was identified a gap in the, in the new triage process, and at least in documenting for, for folks outside of TOC, you know, like what what we can expect and what we should do to help that. Um, but even if that means just backing off, um, is there anything around? You know, <clears throat> real fast as a slight interject, a slight uh, aside. Um, I I don't know if there are any open. There, op um, Amy. I'm not sure if there are still any open um, questions. Uh, I, I believe the only ones that felt somewhat open to me until we answered them in text was the dependencies one, and that's been fairly well answered. Um, the the uh, you know which um, which maintainers are how broadly are organizations represented, and I don't know. I think Daniel had had mentioned this twice, um, but just as a um, just to make sure, um, there are now maintainers from seven, seven, seven organizations, including one in independent person. So that's was one of the biggest tasks during incubation. And yep. um, so, so I think my last question around that with those caveats is, or sorry, with that quick interjection is, is, is there anything else? Um, uh, yeah, anything else that we, we either should, should expect differently or maybe could do to help with that with that triage process or you know kind of where are we with that yeah so um it, it, you started off with the pr um uh, with the set of questions that we asked and then you came well prepared to this meeting and you answered all the questions that we raised so now it is up to us to find somebody to work with you or come back to you with a clear set of uh, asks if we want to change the date uh, to come back 
So that that so you need you should be hearing from us, hopefully quickly. Got it. Okay. And also, just to be very transparent about this, there's there's mm -hmm. no, uh, of course we want to to do this. And what Tomo said is, you know, yes, we don't want to 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 postpone another six months, especially because I don't know that there's anything we would need to do with, within those six months except just keep going as a project. Um, I, I think the main thing, the main reason I'm asking is not to put pressure on anyone, but just because I know that KubeCon is coming up and we just, yeah. I would, we would love as at least a project to, to simply be prepared to, to do the right things if that were, if that were the case. So we're, we're, we're right now still doing that kind of preparation work just in case. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, so it, it, personally, uh, you, if you ask me to uh, give you something to work on right away, right now, would be that, uh, you know, bootstrap committee turning into steering, I would want that written down and like an expiry date put on and a plan published for everybody to be, you know, um, expect what is coming down the line, so to say, right? Uh, because that was kind of wishy-washy a little bit. And also, you know, we were talking about uh, the uh, process for the flagger uh, coming in and, um, you know, there was, uh, it wasn't very clear that there was a solid process that was written down that was followed uh, during that decision-making. So from the governance point of view, I would look at those two. Um, it, today, uh, Justin is not here, uh, usually Justin and Emily, uh, tag team on the security side of things. So, um, it, you know, we probably have to give them a chance to ask some questions on the on the PR itself, right? Is that fair? Yes, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. We'll start on that part right away. Thank you. No worries. Bye everyone, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your time, everyone. Good to see all of you. Huh? You too.